Hey, we're in a series on spiritual warfare. And we wanted to do this because, and I wanted to read this verse, the most important thing to know in all this is that God has a plan for your life. Every single person. The reason we do all the outreach, the reason we do Easter and love 13,000 people coming here to Highland Campus is we believe God has a plan for the lives of all 13,000 people. And in fact, Paul in Romans says this. He calls it his good, pleasing, and perfect will. How many of you want that for your life? You want a good, pleasing, and perfect will. But we want to take time to acknowledge the fact, though, that in the pursuit of that will, we have an opponent. We have an opponent, and his name is Satan. And I don't know if you knew this, but Satan's name means opponent. In fact, in the book of Job, he is really called the Satan. It's his title. He is the opponent. Now, if you look up his name, like in a, in a Greek dictionary or something, it's gonna say the adversary. But does anybody use the term adversary? I mean, you're not Batman, all right? You gotta have an adversary, all right? He is our opponent. And so we need to know that in the pursuit of this, and we just wanna be aware of it, not so we can be scared of Satan, but so that we will be drawn to the Lord. And so I wanna say that at the very beginning of this series, that is the whole point. But we need to be aware of the fact, Jesus said this, says, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But before he said this, before he said that, he said this, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And I want you to know this. And look, we're gonna acknowledge this, and then we're gonna talk about what we do about it, and that's way more important. That you have an opponent, you have an adversary. Satan is coming to kill, kill, steal, and destroy that good, pleasing, and perfect will. He's coming to kill, steal, and destroy the things you love the people you love. We need to acknowledge that. Now, we also need to acknowledge the fact that it's not always Satan. How many know sometimes life is just hard? All right, you walk out in the morning, got a flat tower, that may, a flat tire, that may or may not be Satan. That might just be, you didn't air up your tires and that little light came on yesterday, all right? The Bible tells us that the world is cursed and it's hard. That's why cheesecake tastes good and broccoli's good for you, all right? That's the results of sin. I think it's really ironic that all this started with somebody eating fruit. Now I can't eat cheesecake, all right? <laughs> Life is hard. Here's the other thing. I'm gonna say this about myself. I know it's true about you too, but I won't put that on you, all right? Life is hard, but I'm a sinner, all right? Yeah. My name's Johnny Green, and I'm a sinner. Yeah. And not only that, I am surrounded by sinners, and I work at a church, all right? All you, we're sinners. So sometimes things in our life are the result of life is just hard. Sometimes the result of I'm a sinner and everybody around me is a sinner. But sometimes the Bible tells us things happen in our life because Satan is trying to kill, steal, and destroy God's call and God's plan for your life. Now, once again, let me say this again. We don't say that so that you'll run around being scared. We say that so that we will take our spiritual life seriously. Paul says it this way. He says in, in 1 Corinthians 9, and I didn't give them this on the screen, so that's not their fault. This is my fault. You're gonna have to go back and actually read your Bible for yourself, all right? In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says this. He says, I don't fight like a man beating the air. And what he meant is, I don't shadow box. I saw a guy walking through my neighborhood the other day. He's, he's walking, and as he's walking, he's doing this. He's just kind of, all right? I don't know why he's doing this. I don't get close to him, because there might be a reason he's doing this. All right, but he's just kind of fighting the air. And Paul says in his ministry, I'm not fighting the air, I have an opponent. He said, I discipline my body lest I be disqualified because someone is out there trying to steal what God wants from me. And again, we say that so that we'll take our spiritual life seriously because sometimes, let's be honest, we treat God in our life like an add-on. I, here's what that means to me. I love steak. You can probably look at me and tell, it's a man that loves steak, all right? I love when I can go somewhere and order a steak just the way I want it. Medium rare, just a little bit of salt on it, seared on the edges. I don't want too much sauce and all that kind of stuff. I feel like good steak doesn't need that much. And then one of my favorite moments in life is when I order that steak and they say, 
Would you like some crab meat on that steak? Would I like some crab meat? Come on. They say we can give a little add-on. Sometimes what we want is we want to order our life the way we want it. This is the relationship life that I want. This is the financial life. I I want this, but then God, I'm going to go to church just so I can get a little add-on of peace. Lord, just keep my kids from getting sick. I don't want to go into debt. And we treat our spiritual life like an add-on. When there's a gap in our life, then we call God in, but most of the time we feel like we can do without him. And one of the reasons we want to talk about the fact in this spiritual warfare series that we have an opponent is so that we will, like Paul, take our spiritual life seriously. But it's not so that we run around scared of Satan all the time. So the Bible says that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy what God wants for our life, what we want for our life. So how does he do that? The first way he does it is this. The Bible says that Satan will or can attack us, but he cannot defeat us. And that's important. Satan will attack us, but he cannot defeat us. Satan has power in the physical world. Now, I don't understand how it all works. I'm not gonna explain how it all works, but the Bible says that it's true. It talks about it mostly in the book of Job. Satan attacked Job's body. Satan attacked Job's kids. Satan attacked Job's finances or his wealth. He attacked it. In fact, the apostle Paul, as powerful as he was, The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians 2.18. He says, for we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did. How many feel like Paul's throwing somebody under the bus? Like somebody else didn't really want to come, all right? We wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did, again and again. But what did he say? But Satan blocked our way. I don't know what happened there, but Paul wanted to get somewhere, and he couldn't get there because Satan blocked his way. I want you to know this, Satan can attack you in a physical, and I say physical, just natural stuff, your finances, your health, your home. He can attack you, but here's what's important. He cannot defeat you. And that's what's important to know. And a couple of things are important there. First of all, Satan can't ever do anything that God does not allow. When when Satan attacks Job, he has to go into God's throne room and ask permission. Now, if I'm Job, I'd have been a little bit mad at God for giving him that permission slip. But Satan never surprises God. And we need to know that because sometimes it surprises us. There's people in this room, you've gotten news before, it surprised you. You never expected that. It caught you off guard. I want you to know this. It never caught God off guard. And here's what's even more important. I think this is so important. I think it's so interesting. There is a pattern in the Bible of Satan attacking someone and causing a problem. But later on, when that person and God talk about that problem, the name of Satan never comes up because God was never concerned. So in the book of Job, I mean, Satan attacks Job. And he comes against his kids and his finances and his health. But in Job 38, this is Job 38. I didn't know if you knew that over here. I just realized I was walking through the chapters of Job. That was two, one and two was over there. And 38's right here, all right? Y'all got that in denim? And so in Job 38, when Job is talking to God, you would think at least somewhere Satan's name would come up, but it never came up. Because it was all about the relationship between Job and God and Job's trust in him. One of my favorite verses, and again, I don't have it up here. You have to go read it for yourself. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says this, a messenger of Satan was sent to torment me. How many know you can't get any more clear than that? It was Satan that caused it, and it tormented Paul. A messenger of Satan was sent to torment me. Now I want you to catch the progression here. So Paul prayed to God. That's what what I'm gonna tell you to do. Just spoiler alert, at the end of this message, I'm gonna tell you, bring it all to God. Paul brings it all to God. Does anybody know what God tells him? No. I'm not taking, Paul says, Lord, take this away. And God says, I'm not taking it away. Because in what Satan did to you that never surprised me, you're gonna learn your weakness you're gonna learn that my grace is sufficient for you. 
You're gonna learn that my power is made perfect in your weakness and you are actually gonna live that good, pleasing and perfect will that's gonna come out of what Satan did. I knew he was gonna do it. I allowed for it. I didn't plan it. God doesn't plan it, but I allowed for it and I'm gonna bring my plan in your life through what Satan tried to do to you. So Satan and, I mean, Paul and God never even talk about Satan. In fact, Paul says this, I will boast all the more gladly on my weaknesses. Who gave him his weaknesses? Satan attacked him. Now Paul's boasting boasting about it because he know he can glorify God through it. And I want you to know that's what is going to happen in your life. That's what's going to happen in my life. I don't have to be afraid of Satan. I just need to be aware that he can't defeat me so I can bring it to God. So the second thing he does, he attacks us, but he can't defeat us. Second thing he does, he tempts us, but he can't make us sin. All right. There's a country song that I love said, the devil made me do it the first time, but the second time I done it on my own. That song's only half true, all right? The devil can't make anybody do the first time, all right? Satan will tempt us, but he can't defeat us. Look at what happened in Matthew chapter four. Matthew chapter four, I moved ahead, says this, then Jesus, this is the beginning of his ministry, was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The most obvious verse in the Bible is verse two. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. If they hadn't written this about Johnny Green, it'd have been, and after fasting for 15 minutes, he needed a protein bar. (laughs) The tempter, look at Satan's title there. He's the adversary, he's the opponent, he's the tempter. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. What's going on here? God has sent Jesus out in the desert, And he's told Jesus, I want you to fast for 40 days and 40 nights in preparation for what I've called you to. And when you fast, it doesn't, you know, you would think that when you do God's will, there's no repercussions. You would think I'm fasting, I'm not gonna get hungry. That's not true. He was hungry and Satan comes to him to tempt him. What can we learn from this passage? First of all, if Satan thought he could get Jesus, you better believe he knows he can get you. He knows he can get me. Satan will tempt me. And first of all, he'll tempt me, but the other thing we learned this, what did he tempt Jesus with? He tempted Jesus with what Jesus was hungry for. I need to take a view of my life, an audit of my life, and say, what is it that I'm hungry for? What is it that I think I need to make my life complete? Is it a relationship? Is it security? Is it status? Is it friendships? What is it that I feel like I need this to make my life complete? Because I'm gonna tell you, Satan will use that every single time. And he will tempt us with it. And here's what he does that is so sly. He doesn't come to Jesus and say, I can't believe that. I would turn my back on the Father and never serve him again. It's not what he does. Satan says, what's wrong with the little bread? You can have bread and God's will. One of the things we need to learn about Satan's temptations is Satan will give us options. I believe one of Satan's greatest weapons is it's okay. It's okay. You can do that. You can think that. You can act like that. You can hang out with that person. God doesn't care. If you'll notice in the Bible, Satan gives a lot of options and Jesus gives a lot of ultimatums. Do you ever read Jesus and it feels like he's trying to talk people out of following him? But yet you read Satan and Satan's like, man, it is okay. You can, and here's what's interesting, and I don't have this in here, but go read it. Jesus' response is, man does not live on bread alone. Now, if I'm Satan, and this is kind of what he was saying is, you don't have to live on bread alone. You can have bread and God's will. Jesus knew that wasn't true. Jesus knew that by doing this, that he was giving up God's will. We need to look at our life and take an honest look and say, what is it that I'm saying it's okay and it's not? Because that gives Satan a foothold. And Paul talks about this. Paul says, do not give the devil a foothold. 
And when I allow something into my life and I say, it's okay, it, in a sense, gives Satan leverage. You're not gonna believe this when I tell you, but I, I did some rock climbing for a while, like fake indoor rock climbing. And you're looking at me being like, Bad decision, and I learned that. One of my kids love rock climbing, so I got into rock climbing, and I realized really quickly, rock climbing's not good for big dudes, all right? It's just not. But I did learn about footholds, and there are these things that you need to find that you can put your weight on, and it helps lift you. It gives you leverage. There are things in my life I'm saying okay to, and it's giving Satan leverage in my life. Because I'm thinking I can have both. I'm thinking I have options. And that's Satan telling me. And here's something, I, here's what I would kind of in my mind, what I try to do, I think we ought to do. I don't know if your kids ever come home and said a bad word. And you thought, you didn't hear that in this house. Now, sometimes we're lying to ourselves. They heard it, let's be honest. They heard it in our house, all right? But what do you say? Where did you hear that? Because you don't hear that here. I think sometimes, and here's why, just awareness, knowing that I have an opponent, knowing that there is a tempter out there trying to kill, steal, and destroy what God wants to do in my life. When I say that's okay, I need to ask myself, where did you hear that? Did you hear that in the word of God? Did you hear that from people you trust? Did you hear that from people that you value their spiritual life and you wanna be where they are? Or could that be the voice of Satan telling you, man, that's okay, go ahead and do this. Satan will tempt us, but he can't make us sin. The third thing is this, Satan will accuse us, but he can't condemn us. Isn't it interesting that Satan is called the tempter and then later on he's called the accuser? So what does that say? He tells us it's okay and then we do it. What does he say? I can't believe you did that. You ever had a friend like that? That's how Satan is in our life. In fact, I want, I want to look at this in uh, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, it says this. The great dragon was hurled down. Who is the great dragon? John explains it. That ancient, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. We just talked about that. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in seven saying, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. Look at this. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. He's called the, the opponent, he's called the tempter, and here he's called the accuser. And the Bible tells us that what he does is he accuses us to God, and he says, you know, if he, let's use me as an example. He says, Johnny Green is a low down dirty dog and he has done this, 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 and this, this. Now, here's the problem. When he sells that to God, God doesn't buy it for one second. Because when God looks at me, he doesn't see me. Thank goodness, he sees his son, Jesus Christ. And he says about me what he said about his son. This is my son whom I love. In him, I am well pleased. Hey, come on, let's clap our hands. That's worth clapping your hands for. Now, let me be clear. He only says that if I'm in Christ. If I have made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior and my sins have been forgiven by what Jesus did on the cross, then God looks at me when Satan accuses me. He says, no, that is my son whom I love and in him I am well pleased. But Satan knows if he can't convince God, who can he convince? He can convince me. And he's gonna accuse me to myself. And here's the problem. The Bible says Satan is the father of lies. Every temptation is a lie. Almost everything Satan says to me is a lie, except when he's accusing me. And he says, you did this, 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 and this, and you thought this, and you want to do that, you just weren't able to. And he's probably telling the truth about every single one. And he tries to convince me. And I want you to know that. Satan, when those thoughts come in your head, if you are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, that thought that you're not good enough, that thought that God can't use you because of what you did or can't use you because of what you're doing in your life or anything like that. We're not talking about you know, allowing sin, but that thought that God is not pleased with you, that is a lie from Satan. And that's the lie. It's not a lie that you did it. You probably did it. Let's be honest, all right? That's not the lie. The lie is that God sees that when he looks at you. 
and he doesn't. And here's what's so great. God knew that we couldn't battle this on our own. So he put the Holy Spirit inside of us. And Jesus says this. Jesus says in John chapter 14, he said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. That advocate is the Holy Spirit. And the word advocate means like a defense lawyer. So when Satan accuses you, you've got a built-in defense lawyer that says, I object. I object based on the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and look, that is, that is a lie from Satan that God sees us as a sinner. So Satan will attack us. Satan will tempt us. Satan will accuse us. And, and the next thing, and I wish I had more time to go into this, Satan can possess people, but not people with the Holy Spirit in them. The Bible talks about people, in the Gospels especially, but other places, and, and we believe and I believe that this still exists, that Satan actually possesses or controls people. And, and a good way to say it in the Bible, when you read it in your English Bible, it'll say demon possessed. A great word there is it really means demonized or controlled by Satan. There are people who are controlled by Satan. But I want you to know this. If you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, that is not you. The Holy Spirit and an evil spirit cannot coexist. All right, so if you've got the Holy Spirit inside of you, then Satan can be around you, but he can't be in you. He can influence you, but he can't control you, all right? And so I want you to do this. I wish I had more time to go into this, but Matthew 12 really talks about this. And so I've got those scriptures and I've got some notes. Go on our app. You can get the app and it's got today's sermon notes and it goes through all that. But I want you to know, now, if the Holy Spirit's not inside of you, then Satan can get inside of you. An evil spirit can actually get inside of us. But if we've got the Holy Spirit inside of us, we do not have to worry about that. So what do we do? First of all, we have to recognize this. We can't defeat Satan. He is stronger than me. He is wiser than me. He's got more experience than me, all right? I cannot defeat Satan, but God already has. It's not that he will. It's not that he can. He already has. He says this. Look what Paul says in Colossians chapter two. He says, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in the cross. He nailed that to the cross. God has already defeated Satan. So what is our part? James tells us in James chapter four, he says this, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So what does he say? Submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to God. The first thing we do in battling Satan is we submit our lives completely, unreservedly to God, where there is no part of our life that God does not have complete freedom in. And one way to say it, and I'm gonna have to explain this, is sometimes we wanna get rid of the demon, but we wanna keep the pigs. Feel like I need to explain that statement, all right? Here's the story behind that. In Mark chapter five, there was a man who was demon possessed and Jesus comes into the city and everyone in the town knew him. Everyone was afraid of him. Everyone was afraid that what happened to him could happen to them or someone that they loved and they wanted this problem taken care of. And Jesus comes into this place and he sees this man and it is the strangest conversation ever. I don't have time to put it all up there. Go read it in Mark chapter five. Jesus walks up and asks the demon his name. And the demon says, my name is Legion. That's like saying my name is Battalion, Army Division, because we are many. And so then he, the demon, and here's what's important. The demon already gives up. That's important. In the presence of Jesus, even Satan knows he has no chance. All right? So Jesus shows up, the demon gives up, and he says, I know you're gonna cast us out of here. Weirdest request ever, would you send us into those pigs? And Jesus says, that sounds like a great idea. I will send you into those pigs. I've never seen a demon-possessed pig. I think I'd pay to see a demon-possessed pig. I don't know what that looked like. Jesus cast the demon out. The demons go into the pigs and the pigs go running and they run down this the embankment and they run into the river. They drown thousands of dead floating pigs. I don't know what that looked like, all right? 
craziest story ever. But here's the takeaway. When the people of the town hear about that, because those pigs were their livelihood. So these were either Jews who were uh, disobeying God's law by raising pigs, or they were Gentiles. Scholars disagree on which one was which. But these pigs were their livelihood. Said all that to say, look in Mark chapter five, verse 16 and 17. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man. You would think that would be amazing news. You would think they would throw a party and told them about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Why did they ask Jesus to leave? Because they were more interested in the pigs than what Jesus could do for them. There are areas of my life. I want Jesus to come in and cast a demon out of that area, but I wanna keep what I wanna do in this area. And as we said before, that gives Satan a foothold. One of the things I wrote down, I I write stuff. I write stuff to myself. Like I need to help myself out. And one of the things I wrote down a few years ago is that life is about connecting the right this to the right that. Because sometimes I want that and I think this has nothing to do with that. But this is totally connected to that. And there are things, Lord, I want you to do that in my life. I want you to do that in my finances, that in my relationships, that in my body, but Jesus, don't touch this. And Jesus says, until you give me this, I'm not gonna do anything with that, all right? And that's what, until you give me the pigs, someone, you can clap your hands. And I'm wondering why Satan is active in my life, just running crazy in in my mind and in my family and in different areas of my life. And I feel like, why is it so hard? Why do I feel like I have such an opponent in everything that I try to do? It's because I try to compartmentalize and I only want Jesus involved in that. And Jesus says, I want you to give me this. When we submit this to God, Jesus drives that out of our life. So we submit ourselves to God. We resist the devil. And I think the most important way that we resist the devil is in our minds. Or we resist the devil. It says when you resist the devil, he'll flee. And we resist him in our minds because the Bible says that Satan is the father of lies. And he will lie to us all day long. He will lie to us through temptation. He will lie to us through accusation. He will lie to us with statements about our future and what we're capable of and how God can use us. He will lie to us all day long and the Bible calls that a stronghold. That there is an area of my life And I believe there's people out there and I think God wants to break it out this morning. You need to be at the altar in about 10 minutes, all right? There is a stronghold in your life Paul calls it a stronghold, all right? In fact, you can put that verse up there where he says, we, Paul says, we demolish strongholds. How do we demolish them? By taking captive every thought. And a stronghold is this. It's an area of my life that I've given up on in terms of God. That I felt like I have battled this for so long, God, I don't believe you can set me free of that. And it's like I've allowed Satan to build a wall around that part of my life and I don't let the Holy Spirit get in, not because I just want it, but because I've given up. Because now I believe the lies of the enemy that I have absolutely no future. I believe the lies of the enemy that I can't have joy in my life until something in my life changes. Or I believe the lies of the enemy are what I'm worth or what my future is. And I've let his lies build a stronghold in my life. But Paul says this, we demolish those strongholds by taking every thought How many know in battles it is one hand to hand? That I have got to take every thought. I've got to be aware of every thought. Like Paul said, I don't beat the air, but I fight like it matters on every single thought and I bring it obedient to the law of God, to the will of Jesus Christ. And so I resist Satan by battling him in every single thought of my head. So he says this, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil and he will flee. And the third thing is this, draw near to God, and I love this, and he will draw near to you. 
It doesn't say he might draw near to you. I love what Pastor JT said. We don't serve a blue moon, God. I ain't heard that in a long time, all right? We don't serve a every once in a while, God. If we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. And look, I want to encourage you. There are some people out there, and you've been fighting battles in your life, battles of sickness, battles of lies in your mind, battles in relationship, battles with your kids. I want to encourage you this. Draw near to God. Pray like it matters. Some of you may need to start fasting, and not just fast for one day, but say, I'm not taking this anymore. I'm not allowing Satan to have a stronghold in my family, a stronghold in my life. There was a time in my life, there was things going on in my family and in my home, and I felt so helpless. Literally, I had done everything I could think of, and nothing, it only got worse, like the woman with the issue of blood. Went and visited all the doctors and it only got worse. And I decided this, the Bible says oil is a symbol of the power of the Holy Spirit. And I wake up, I'm usually the first one up in my household. And one of the first things I do is I read my Bible and I have my routine. I get up and I read my Bible and I pray. But how many know sometimes there's things in your life that you gotta go above and beyond the routine? You can't just be checking a box. And I got some oil from the church and I woke up every single morning and I anointed every door in my household with oil. And I prayed over every single door. And I would love to tell you I prayed and in a week everything, it actually got worse. It went, I mean, it just went down like this. But I didn't stop. I prayed and I prayed. And God gave me breakthrough in that situation. We, we, had a, we had a family in church, the wife, dealing with medical issues. And finally the husband said, we have had enough of this. He texted me and some dudes and we met up here and we anointed her with oil and we took communion and we prayed over her and it got worse, literally while we were standing here. So you know what the husband did? He got people together the next week and God broke it off of her. There are some people out there, you've got something in your life and you've given up. You've allowed Satan to build a stronghold around it. God wants to set you free, but you've got to draw near to him. And if you'll draw near to him, he'll draw near to you.